subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss a video from Live Law. Hi everybody. So we are here with Miss <clears throat> Karuna Nandi, and uh, Karuna, you are one of the most inspiring people out there. Gosh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Not only are you a lawyer, but you've also worked with the United Nations, and uh, we recently heard about your being appointed to a UK panel, which is working about uh, media freedom around the world. Now you've taken up several causes. At the same time, you're somebody who works in commercial laws and arbitration, so you've quite a wide array there. My first question to you is with regard to the latest development uh, of the Allahabad High Court. Mm. I mean, they ordered that all these um, boards which are out there mm. uh, having names and pictures of anti-CA protesters should be taken down immediately. And then here in Delhi, we are also seeing that, you know, I mean, there's a struggle. Uh, Harsh Mandir has filed a petition and there's a lot of controversy around it. And while the riots have, you know, gone, riots have already taken place. So there hasn't been that turn of an action in my point of view from the judiciary as it should have been. Now the matter is pending, but what is your take on how as a state, how as a judiciary, this entire CAA issue has been dealt with? Uh, not just with law in mind, but also just broadly, you know, be that the judiciary, be that the police uh, and other stakeholders involved. How do you see this entire issue? Okay, so that's a big question. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, let's take it one by one. Sure. With regard to the Allahabad High Court order, it is so important to see that when the courts are doing the work that our courts are meant to do, that things can happen first and things can happen in a, in a manner that if you're just following the law, it can, constitutional rights can be protected. Mm. The thing to remember is that with those billboards being taken down. And for those who don't know, it was billboards of people who had been accused of destroying property pursuant to the CAA protests. Right. Um, and it was on a, a gold chakar somewhere yes. in Allahabad. It was very, very public. And not just that, it also included their addresses. Mm. Right. Mm. So my problem with that is threefold. First, the fact that a government can act in a way that is so deeply violating of mm. people's rights. Think about it. Mm. Sadaf Jafar has small children. Mm. There was, she was uh, saying on a panel yesterday that I was on, that her small child had put a rickety shoe rack against the door mm. and saying that, Ma, if these people come, if the mob comes, then I will keep us safe. So now imagine the kind of mental agony that that family goes through. Mm. What has the child done? What have the old parents done? Yes. That the address mm. is on the choraha, mm. right? Um, so now, hearteningly, the High Court has said that this is against privacy, right? Mm. Putta Swami, on, it's a nine-judge bench, it's yes. very clear on the constitutional foundations of right to privacy. the right to privacy. Right. We don't, unfortunately, have a law yet, you know, specifically. There is also a right to um, not be lynched, you know. And so it would be one thing that if the purported naming and shaming only had photos and names, even though that would be unlawful. I feel the part that has not been addressed is the part where the address was put out. Because why is the address being put out? It is an invitation to a mob. It is an invitation to non-state actors to either protest mm. outside the house, mm. right? Mm. At best, at worst, to commit violence. In the current situation in UP, it appears to me that the violence aspect cannot be overlooked at all. In such a situation, I would have sort of deeply wished that, I don't know if this was even put before the court, mm. Uh, that there would be damages awarded and criminal, at the very least, disciplinary action against the state actors that saw fit to award, mm. uh, to, to put out these, um, these billboards. I think it's very important to remember, though, that a lot is being put on our, a lot of burden is being placed on our, our courts, and in particular, our constitutional courts. Mm. And that if at the first instance, the governments do not act constitutionally, mm. you see, mm. it becomes almost impossible mm. for courts, one, to act in time. Because if you even if you look in this case, and you look at the fact that the High Court took 
as prompt action as they possibly yeah. could have. Absolutely. They sat on a Sunday, mm. you know. Mm. Still, the address is out, mm. you see. Mm. And so to a significant extent, the damage is already done. Mm. Secondly, the jurisdiction of uh, constitutional courts is not to look into every single thing. Mm. Thirdly, the capacity, the bandwidth of our courts is still very limited. Our judges per million is uh, still one of the lowest around the world, yeah. lower than a number of countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Mm. Um, not just our judges per million, that also brings with it court infrastructure that is limited. It also brings with it the fact that we don't have enough of a legal aid mm. system, that we don't have enough prosecutors, we don't have enough, um, you know, it seems like we have a lot of lawyers sometimes, mm. but we don't actually. Yeah. And so, um, the bandwidth of our courts is limited. So if governments don't act constitutionally in the first instance, there is something of a disaster that happens. Mm -hmm. So I do think that it would be truly wonderful if there were some major prods mm -hmm. to make sure that governments do act constitutionally. Yeah. Um, and it's not an easy task mm -hmm. before our courts. I mean, these are very, very testing times. Mm -hmm. But, you know, would you rather be an HR Khanna or would you rather be someone else? Yes, I absolutely. Think that's, that's a choice, I think, uh, that a lot of Yes. Judges are facing today. Yes. But uh, because you mentioned about the time, yeah. let me just sort of, you know, um, explore with you a legal idea that I've been thinking about mm -hmm. for quite some time. Now, what we see daily in the High Courts and in the Supreme Court mm. is while there are particular matters which take away a big chunk of the court's time, mm. there are other matters which do not seem to even get like a minute of hearing. Mm. Now, of course, there are other dynamics at play. So, for example, if there are senior advocates arguing a matter, mm. of course, the tendency is to give them higher time you know uh, mm. length of time to be heard mm. um, at the same time there are times when a file is just flung uh, you know with the assumption that if a judge is hearing a matter mm. the judges have already studied the file in advance and come mm. now here is my my uh, you know sort of proposition and mm. tell me what you think about it don't you think that there should be something like a right to time where depending on what category of case it is, for example, mm. if it's a matrimonial case or a bail matter or an appeal matter, mm. that the registry or like a third neutral person in the premises of the court should decide a fixed time ahead and say that irrespective of who is appearing for you. I mm. mean, you may be a farmer, but for that for, for that one matter that you have that goes to the Supreme Court, it mm. is as important as, let's say, a matter which involves, you know, billions of dollars of a, co a corporate company. Mm. So why not give both the sides an equal time to put forth their arguments also mm. so that it it's not just you know i mean justice should not only be done it should also seem to be done mm. so my whole idea is what are your views on this disproportionate allocation of time mm. that the judges seem to allot to various issues that come up before them i mean with regard to fixed time being allocated by the registry i think this is difficult because i would rather judges decided this mm. you know i would rather judges decided given that we have article 136 and we have article 142 and given that this is one of the widest jurisdictions not no this possibly our court has the widest jurisdiction of any court in the world Absolutely. right um and they will then he, so you anyone can file an slp and be before the court on a monday or a friday mm. sometimes for five seconds mm. sometimes for longer mm. right um I think the fact that the judge can decide either way is important because one doesn't want to then fall prey to the any possible prejudices within the registry. Like you'd rather just be before the judge and have a opportunity to persuade the judge. Mm -hmm. Now, given the pressure on time, I think you're right that credible counsel and one of the ways to uh, uh, to designate who a credible counsel is mm -hmm. um, is uh, apart from the history of an individual's work is who a, a, a senior counsel, a designated senior counsel is. So given the paucity of time, I can see that that can be a shortcut. Mm -hmm. But, but then and, and what you're saying is not fees. wrong. Yeah. What you're yeah. saying is not wrong yeah. in that access to justice is severely limited. Mm -hmm. It's hugely unbalanced mm -hmm. against poor people. Mm -hmm. And why is that? It's because if you are, look, you're a judge. Imagine you're a judge mm -hmm. and you're sitting there. Mm -hmm. And there's one person after another just coming and saying, you know, like my lord, and like talking some rubbish and like you have to apply your own mind mm. and come up with and compensate. And this is, I think, the duty of any judge mm. to compensate for the council's lacks mm. in order to do justice for the council's client. Mm. Right. Mm. This, I think, is the duty of a judge. Mm. So it's a tough, tough, tough mm. job. 
Um, and I think Justice Murli Dhar said something similar. Yes. Um, but how much easier is it, you know, if uh, sort of Harish Salve came and just told you something that is, is very legally sophisticated, mm. right? Mm. It's just easier because then you, you're like, okay, here's somebody who's reliable in terms of their law and knows what they're talking about. I think that it's fundamental, fundamental for our benches mm. to make sure that one is not giving that deference, mm. that one is making sure to that listen. You neutral. No, not neutral. Mm. If you are neutral, you're going to go with the sophisticated lawyer mm. and you're not going to go with the other person, mm. right? If no, you're neutral. I, I meant by neutral saying hearing both the sides irrespective of who's appearing. Not just hearing both the sides. I think one has to compensate mm. and listen much more carefully to the lawyer who is not as sophisticated, mm. who is not able to put the view in as sophisticated terms, mm. who is the only lawyer that the Client farmer, the yeah. small company, yeah. the Dalit person, the mm. woman yes. could afford. Mm. I think it's fundamental to justice. Mm. No, thank you so much for saying that. I think it's extremely important that that happens. Now, of course, how do we bring a structure around it is something that has to be thought through more. I think it could just be orientation. Mm. Orientation and bandwidth. I think if if our uh, judges had more time, mm. I think that would be helpful. Mm. Mm. Now, the other question um, pertains to the <coughs> movement. Uh, mm. It's been a while mm. uh, that, you know, we're not seeing that much debate. I mean, it, the, the entire movement had a peak. Mm. And, you know, I saw you also actively speaking about the mm. entire Me Too movement. Mm. Now, the Me Too movement for me was very interesting. Uh, mm. It was a women's issue. Several women came out. Mm. Of course, how many of them could go to the courts for lack of evidence was one part of the puzzle. Mm. The other was we were talking about a major, you know, we were talking about rule of law mm. uh, and we were talking about it in a very different way than that had been done before. Mm. In retrospect, or if I may say so, in hindsight, mm. how do you look at the entire movement? Do you think it created the necessary wave and do you think it could it led to a major impact that was much coming? Um, how do you see the entire Me Too movement now? I think the Me Too movement is comes in waves and it's not over. Mm. What it was, is, is people speaking up about the harassment that they have faced mm. from powerful people. And the reason it's called Me Too is because one person spoke up mm. and then a completely unrelated person mm. said, I was raped, mm. I was sexually harassed, I was molested mm. by this person when I was working with them, mm. you know. Mm. So it wasn't just one other person, then a third person stood up somewhere, yes. a fourth person maybe anonymously, a fifth person had the courage to reveal their name because they were protected in other particular ways, mm. right? Mm. This is fundamentally important because what it does, and it did for me and it does uh, has done for a lot of people I think, is that it opens people's eyes mm. to the fact that there are a large, large number of people who are not approaching our justice system. Mm. And we have to fundamentally soul search and ask ourselves why. We have to reconstitute ourselves in response. Mm. Because what these people were saying is that I know that there is a possibility that I will be sued for defamation. Mm. And yet I am speaking up. Mm. I know this. And yet the burden that is placed on me when I go to the police or when I bring a civil suit. And let us keep in mind that claiming civil damages for sexual harassment, which is hugely common in the United States, it's hugely common in other parts of the world, is not only non-existent here, it is hugely frowned upon, mm. you know. Mm. This is also, I think, something that needs to change and it needs to change now. Mm. Because the woman who was sexually harassed, mm. I have seen women quit their professions, mm. you know. In a recent case that I'm uh, dealing with, quit the photography profession because they felt that I can't, I can't deal with this and I don't want to come across this particular person. I don't want them to have any power over me. Mm. I have seen people, if you look at the woman who testified against Brett Kavanaugh, mm. she had to have two front doors in every single house yeah. that she lived in. She was a Stanford, she's a Stanford professor. Mm. And even the cost of breaking open that front door, mm. imagine the psychological trauma that a person faces to have to have two front doors in every house they have, mm. so that there's a way in which they can. Mm. Um, 
There is psychological trauma and PTSD counseling that costs money. If you can't take a particular kinds of transport as a result, there are major costs. Mm. If you do not rise as fast in your career as you would have otherwise, there are major damages that are owed mm. to these survivors. Mm. And our legal system, we have to start creating the jurisprudence, the taught jurisprudence that in any to case we have to strengthen kind of to pro mm. provide the kind of civil remedies mm. um, that are required, not just injunctions on speech. Mm. Um, secondly, I think with regard to the criminal process, I think a lot of people are engaged in the criminal justice system and working on ways to make, make them work for women. In terms of the aftermath of Me Too, what we've seen a lot more is defamation cases, unsuccessful defamation, defamation cases. And one of the things we talked about just now is access to justice. Yeah. And the powerful person who was in a position of power in order to um, molest or sexually harass a large number of women is also usually the person who can hire the Best fancier, lawyer. more sophisticated lawyer. Mm -hmm. But also, mm -hmm. um, their client can take out the time, can afford the time, mm. can afford to look at the documentation, can hire a tech expert to retrieve particular data that, that serves them, mm. as opposed to the other side. Mm. So what we are seeing currently, I think, is a lot of that imbalance serving mm. um, people who are or might be harassers. Mm, mm. So I think that's a problem. And, and I think what you're saying is that does the Indian legal system have the jurisprudence to deal with these kind of sensitive issues that are coming out? I mean, one way is to say, all right, you know, defamation cases and the usual remedies we've been giving under defamation, but, but we're not really being sensitive to these several issues that you bring forth. Uh, but moving, but yes, uh, yes. Because on, of on. that, hmm. because of that, I think that this is a kind of civil disobedience. Mm. The rising of the Me Too complaints was a kind of civil disobedience. Mm. And if anything, it needs to be a wake up call mm. to our legal system. Mm. And we really, all of us in it, mm. have to work very, very hard mm. to reconstitute ourselves to serve mm. our citizens. Now, it's interesting you bring up the civil disobedience movement because one question, again, I've been struggling with, um, and I think a lot of people in the legal profession are thinking about is that well, there are some issues for which one would think that, of course, going to the court is a natural uh, you know, mm. pathway. You've approached the court for marital rape. Mm. Uh, marital rape is interesting because discussing it in a country like India, mm. where, there, where the issue is very culturally embedded, and uh, naturally there will be a lot of resistance to that kind of, uh, kind of idea of marital rape. Mm. You know, the obvious arguments being, well, there's a lot of potential for misuse because you know, where will you get the evidence to prove that there was marital rape, so on and so forth. Mm. But but that argument aside, at a deeper level, mm. you've been you've really championed this cause of marital rape and mm. we're still to see what the courts will decide eventually. Mm. But uh, what was your experience like? Did you face a lot of resistance and what do you say back? So how do you pick up issues which which clearly require much more receptivity in the society mm. and where law just kind of plays one part of it, mm. but then a major acceptability, you know, behavior change are kind of these other paths of it. So mm. as a lawyer, how do you navigate when you're working on issues like this, where you just realize that, you know, okay, I can go to the court, but, but, but that's not the entire battle. I think it's very important to remember that law and culture, law and society has a dialectical relationship. Mm. So there is a way in which if a law is created, it mm. constitutes society and vice versa, mm. right? So there's a relationship that carries on. Right. For example, when our constitution came in, mm. There, was, there were huge discussions in the Constituent Assembly about whether group rights should have greater role and, and over individual rights. Right. And um, to a significant ex extent, and I think uh, Baba Saheb, uh, uh, Dr. Mbedkar, particularly championed this idea of individual rights. And the reason is that if you are identified as a Dalit or even as a Mahar or nowadays, you know, as a Bahujan, mm -hmm. right? Um, do you want that identity to be reified, to be frozen in time? Um, that, that's also the debate between Lauter Pact when, and Lemkin. Mm. You know, Lemkin who um, pioneered the idea of 
genocide mm -hmm. and Lauter Pact who sort of pioneered the idea of crimes against humanity. Mm -hmm. And the debate between them was that do you look at the targeted person as a member of a particular group, of, as a member of a population, or as an individual, individual right? Yeah. And so there are ways in which you can freeze categories and you can look at people as individuals. Um, as a result, though, I think what has happened that our constitution has shaped who citizens are. There are various judgments, for example, the uh, judgment on the uh, Justice Thakur's judgment and even though I almost always agree with Justice Chandrachur, um, whether he's dissenting or whether he's in a majority, in this I actually agreed with what uh, the majority was saying, what Justice Thakur was saying. And what he said was that you can't um, solicit votes based on who you are, mm. what your identity is, mm. right? That you can solicit, but you can speak about the issues. So I think that is a move towards looking at a citizen as a person who can understand policy and it doesn't have to be, policy doesn't have to be abstract and sophisticated or even be called policy, right? When you are speaking of something, when you are speaking, for example, of reservation, then that's speaking of policy, right? Um, constituting a citizen as a citizen. In the same way, now coming back to marital rape, um, I think that in a conversation in the bedroom, if a woman is saying no, and he says, but I have a right, I'm your husband, and she says, no, you don't, right? That is a normative shift that happens in the bedroom because of the force of law. Because the constitution of India tells her that she has a right to bodily integrity. A nine judge bench in Puttaswami has already said that a woman has a right to bodily integrity. The a two judge bench in independent thought has already said that a woman has a right to bodily integrity in the context of marriage. You cannot, regardless of what culture says or a majority says, or whether or not it seeps into the culture, mm. take away mm. that right to bodily integrity. Mm. And in every single instance, mm. it must be enforced if the woman has the courage to come to court mm. or to the police. Mm. At the same time, we must remember that law operates through a positive force, but also through a normative shift. And that normative shift cannot be underestimated. Mm. Now, speaking of normative shifts, mm. I think one area where we desperately need it mm. is with regard to the rights of the press, the media, mm. but also their duties. Mm. So what we are seeing in India is mm. that media being the fourth pillar of democracy yes. is playing a very crucial role in shifting the narratives in one favor or the other. Absolutely. Now, I know that there have been some cases in the UK mm. where in one particular case, the question was that whether whatever the news channels show as news mm. can even be counted as news mm. because under the laws, they have been categorizing their channels as a news channel. Mm. But what goes on is so much more than the news channels. And that mm. debate did take place. Mm. In India, we yet to have that debate. Mm. We accept that, okay, the moment a news channel sort of categorizes themselves as a news channel, mm. they're a news channel. Mm. Uh, and you're part of this panel that is working about media's freedom. Mm. Now, there are two ways of it, right? So mm. one is... Uh, media feeling and having the right to express themselves freely and to mm. air whatever it is that they want mm. but then there is the other side to it about mm. the media's responsibility of being fair mm. you know so what is it tell us more about your work with the panel mm. and how do you see this entire debate especially in the Indian context so I think that the media at the moment is out of control mm. you know it's completely out of control and it is also being targeted hugely at the same time mm. So you have, um, you have particularly on television, uh, you have, and but also, you know, in some of the, more so in the vernacular press, you have people, and television in English and other languages as well, you have incitement to violence, specific incitement to violence, sometimes against specific people. Mm. You have huge defamation mm. that is sometimes happening. You have uh, fake news that is being peddled. That's a particularly difficult issue that not just our panel, that the Columbia Experts Committee that I'm on and, you know, a, a large number of us, you know, people uh, uh, working here on these issues uh, that we are working with. Um, 
are grappling with. And the mm. fake news issue, I think, is very difficult because mm. my fake news is your legitimate opinion. It can be, mm. right? Mm. Um. But except for like a, a core, which is whether it's factually correct or not, you know, if there's something that's verifiable and there, you know, organizations like Alt News and Boom, etc. have mm. played a very salutary Absolutely. role. Um, so I think that the voluntary regulation structure that television has come up with is not working. It's just not working. Um, in terms of incitement to violence, we don't see enough action in order to curb that because the Radio Rwandas now are proliferating like cancers. Um, and it's very dangerous in, a, in the situation that we find ourselves today. In terms of media freedoms though, um, we also find the flip side that people who are doing the work are being limited in various ways and you see sometimes direct court cases against journalists but sometimes you also see ancillary attacks. Mm. You see, mm. you see an ancillary attack mm. against a particular journalist. Mm. Either they will be mm. defamed on social media by the stormtroopers, the non-state stormtroopers that are attached to a particular party mm. uh, or persuasion. Um, or you will see a ancillary case, court case, you know, coming in mm. uh, on regulatory points mm. and shutting down media houses mm. or you will see a denial of government ads mm. which is a huge source of revenue for some mm. um, or you will see people being told people being called up and told don't advertise with this particular media house and let mm. us bleed them dry mm. you see mm. so there are ways in which the sort of media environment here is suffering mm. I think that and what is the What has died then, or what is dying, mm. is the right of a citizen, you know, as articulated very nicely in the three judges' case, and particularly in S.P. Gupta, mm. to know. Mm. It is the fundamental part of Article 19 1A, right? Mm. Is the right of a citizen to know. Mm. And I think what it also cuts off is the channel between government and citizens. So if you don't know what's going right and what's going wrong, mm. from whether there's a tuberculosis outbreak in a state that you are governing, mm. or whether you know some women are being assaulted and raped, mm. or whether your Aadhaar is working or not working or whatever. If you have people who are self-censoring because they think that you're not going to like what you are going to hear, mm. then even the things that you feel you need to hear are not going mm. to come. You see? Yeah. So it is a fundamental breakdown in governance. Mm. These pipes tell the citizens what, you know, what everything the citizens should know. But they also bar government from hearing what government would otherwise hear. Mm. So that's a fundamental breakdown in democracy. Mm. But what the constitution of India, I think, tried to do was to bring all of us together, mm. irrespective of our differences, mm. and and make uh, you know and, and make a country of us mm. in the sense that where we try to have a very delicate balance between the individual rights and collective rights. <coughs> and one important aspect of keeping such diverse people together is the right to dissent. Mm. What you're seeing in India today mm. is that there is almost a crushing down of dissent in every form. Hmm. on every platform hmm. where you see individual IAS officers, IPS officers being targeted heavily hmm. such that the most powerful voices be that in the litigation profession hmm. or be that in other you know I mean be that journalism, media or Bollywood hmm. you kind of see that as if the creamy layer so to say hmm. and this is my point of view I'm, hmm. I'm using the word consciously hmm. the creamy layer also seems to be towing the line if I may say so hmm. now if that is the impunity prevailing in the atmosphere, mm. then how do you get up every day as a lawyer, mm. you know, um, trying to find your own voice and then also become the voice of other people? Mm. And at what cost? Mm. So if law cannot protect you, mm. uh, then how do you still continue using law to, you know, sort of ask for this right to dissent? And do you fear that mm. this dissent is being crushed? Because I, I kind of feel it's very, very hard times we're living in, mm. where if you and I may disagree on something, but mm. if we cannot express our dissent, mm. then there is something 
you know which is breaking down in terms of the constitutional morality hmm. so how how do you how do you see this entire issue of being able to dissent in india and where it is today the right to dissent is i think has is really being crushed into the ground uh in a number of ways one way is that people who speak the black is being painted as white and white is being painted as black people who are calling for peace are being told that they are instigating violence you know people who are calling from for violence are being told that what they are saying is free speech so i think these are the things that are really a test mm. of of all of our metal all of our humanity mm. um because it is not just the court cases that are being brought against people who speak mm. and whether it's an ni investigation whether it's a defamation case whether it's um a 153a you know all these all these cases that very frequently don't apply mm. at all mm. um but also that there are other actions you know there are there is the when you see the impunity with which the abvp students went in mm. to jnu yes and with the police just standing there mm. when you see the impunity with which people were bust into gargi college mm. as and um molested en masse mm. these young women who weren't protesting i mean they had nothing to do with any of this absolutely you know mm. so when you see the impunity with which the shooter shot at the jamia protesters and there's a very um compelling picture of the police personnel standing at the back and there's one man leaning on his lathi watching mm. you see mm. in a very relaxed way and he had his back to the only people in the crowd with guns mm. and with a duty to disable him if necessary mm. and he did not seem to have a problem with that mm. so these issues i think give rise to a sense of impunity mm. and give courage to the people who want to go and assault others mm. to the stormtroopers mm. so in such a situation of course people are very very scared to speak mm. but what is the test i think mm. at this point for all of us whether it is our judiciary whether it is citizens whether it is lawyers that do you want to be silent in the face of extreme oppression and do you want to know that you were silent when people were being killed mm. Mm. or do you want to be able to look your child your niece your nephew in the face and say that when the time came when it was not convenient when it was not easy i did what in my own small way i was required to do as a human and as a citizen you know mm. yeah that's very well said very well said uh my last question to you then karna uh there are a lot of causes that you've championed there's a lot of great work you're doing you've done in the past um but what what would you what would you say has been your biggest achievement um thus far in terms of impact or in terms of social change hmm. uh, and uh, i'm not necessarily looking for one thing but i'm also just trying to really understand what do you think constitutes social change you know when do you rest and say all right you know uh, we've achieved something because otherwise it's just a very strenuous path hmm. so what do you sit back and tell yourself uh, that this is you know something uh, to give more fuel so to say to carry on the path that you're on you know i think every um, every victory is not just a victory of one individual mm. it's always a victory of a team of people always mm. you know yes and sometimes you get congratulated when you did um, um, a fair amount and sometimes somebody else gets congratulated when you did a huge amount you know and sometimes yes. the reverse mm. right so that happens mm. Mm. but every victory mm. has a lot of people involved mm. um i think every victory of a constitutional right is really heartening mm. because you feel that all that work that you're putting in you know all that midnight oil all those papers mm-hmm. there was a meme going around with some law students uh-huh. you know about me mm-hmm. 
and there was a picture sort of of me kind of in in robes looking out into the distance and then there was a uh, there was a law student like sitting under a pile of papers and the meme was basically that this is the dream this is where i want to be and this is the reality i think the thing to remember is that that is also my reality being under a pile of papers right and that is also where the joy is if you don't find find joy in the process of law you're not going to survive you know like finding that idea that works you know that serves your client that serves your cause like having gone through the pile of papers and found it at the bottom. Yes. You know? Yes. Um, <coughs> of course, now I have a team to help and it's a different role, but um, there's still a lot of, there's still a lot of papers. Mm. So, times that I felt that um, very glad to serve in the system, I think was one of the times was in the in a case in which a very eminent disabled woman, Jija Ghosh, was taken off a flight, and I was asked to argue for the the institution adapt, and uh, she was she was represented by Mr. Gonzalez, and we both argued together, mm -hmm. and the the judgment that Justice Ikri gave, that the Supreme Court gave, mm -hmm. was a such a heartening, mm -hmm. upholding of human dignity, mm -hmm. you know, and. Also, in hard terms, and this is what I had focused on, mm. on damages, mm. on money mm. to be given to her. Mm. This is the part that I had argued mm. um, as a deterrent for taking her off the flight. So that is something that, that I was quite heartened by. Another was that, you know, when I was initially briefed in the Bhopal cases, I think the first thing that really struck me was that these people who had genetic abnormalities, etc., caused by the gas leak were also drinking at the time, still drinking, and for many decades, water that was laced with hexachlorocyclohexanes, dichlorobenzenes, chemicals that cause cancer, neurotoxicity, mm. you know, ending periods, some of the people couldn't have children, mm. um, that weren't affected by, that even some of those who weren't affected by the gas would escape the effects of the gas, mm. right? Um, and I was somewhat amazed by that, mm. that this was a continuing poison, poisoning that was happening. Mm. And so we had to fight long and we had to fight hard. But um, with the support of the continual support, actually, of the court, of the Supreme Court, um, and the hard work of the survivors mm. uh, and the survivors organizations, we were able to get safe water mm. to most of the people or almost all the people who were drinking that water. Mm. Um, there are many battles to be fought in the Bhopal cases. Um, sometimes I have been sort of fairly, it's very much, uh, I would like to think it's David versus Goliath. It could be the ant and the elephant, <laughs> you know. Um, because at this point, there is a small and committed group of people that are against some of the largest powers mm. in the world. Governments in collusion with, um, and I'm not speaking of our government uh, uh, necessarily, but that around the world we have governments in collusion with the with corporates. Mm -hmm. You see, um, and the structures allow that. Mm -hmm. So you have the Obama government. In fact, the Assistant Secretary of State wrote a letter to the Planning Commission here, and uh, when it was a UPA government saying, um, can you just deal with this Dow issue? Mm -hmm. You see, now we have a situation, we have electoral bonds mm -hmm. and we don't know. And uh, as a company, you're allowed to give mm -hmm. money we don't know who, where to is the parties. All this political funding coming from. So we don't know mm -hmm. what the connections are mm -hmm. between the, the particular corporates and the governments. So what we're up against is absolutely, absolutely massive. Mm -hmm. I think in the face of this, sometimes when one is feeling discouraged, I was reminded by one of the survivor leaders that to keep the issue alive in and of itself mm -hmm. is something that is so important and so fundamental. And to constantly work hard, be ready mm -hmm. to, because at some point in time, the tides of history may rise and hope and justice may rhyme. Mm -hmm. This is Seamus Heaney. Uh, paraphrased. <laughs>
So keeping the battle on is sometimes the biggest victory. Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, there have been, there have been other proper victories, sure, you know, no, no, that agree. one I feels <laughs> much more happy yeah, about. But this has been a difficult process for me, particularly as, you know, with my personality, I think, mm -hmm. because I think I'm much more about impact, mm -hmm. you know, and wanting to go in there, make an impact and win. And then that's it. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you lose, you lose. But, you know, you work hard, you try, you win, you lose, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, so this was has been a really learning and growing and personally um, a, a challenging process for me. Um, of course, you know, when um, a leading producer in Bollywood went to, um, uh, you know, went into custody again, and we were representing pro bono, a very young rape victim. Mm -hmm. um, that was a heartening win, uh, contributing to the process of striking section 66a down as well as looking at intermediary liability and website blocking mm -hmm. that was heartening mm -hmm. contributing to the law the anti-rape laws that was really heartening and i think legislation contributing to legislation is underestimated mm -hmm. because that's a way in which a whole structure can change mm -hmm. and our processes in making legislation are far too ad hoc mm -hmm. so i think contributing for for all of us as lawyers to contribute to legislation, I think is very, very important. Because when it comes to the court on a particular, it becomes very narrow, it becomes very narrow, particular yeah. issue, yeah. you know. Great. So here's wishing you many more constitutional Thank victories. you. <laughs> Thank you so much for speaking to Thank us. You so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss a video from Live Law.